Now it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Stephen Reynolds, Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer of the Bellevue-based Puget Energy, a Fortune 1000 company, and its utility subsidiary, Puget Sound Energy. PSE, the state's oldest and largest energy utility, has been providing gas service to Seattle homes and businesses since 1873. Steve is here today to discuss the critical relationship between building and maintaining a strong infrastructure and our region's ability to sustain a strong, growing economy. More specifically, he will focus on a particular layer of that infrastructure, human capital, and the need for our workforce at all levels to be more reflective of society's increasingly diverse population. I should note the workforce diversity is not a new priority for Steve's company. More than a decade ago, for example, Puget Sound Energy helped the University of Washington establish the Business and Economic Development Center. That center, which is well represented here today, has been doing great things to help today's minority students become tomorrow's business leaders. Some of Steve's colleagues at PSC have a strong leadership role at that center, such as PSC Federal Relations Director Nina O'Dell, and Tommy Omoraguchi, CEO of Wajimaya, and a member of PSC's Board of Directors. Fellow Rotarians, please welcome Steve Reynolds. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me in the back? I am actually thrilled to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to address one of the, simply the largest uh, rotary groups anywhere in the world, uh, and uh, the opportunity to talk about some issues and ideas that I am quite passionate about. Um, your Rotary's membership uh, represents some of the greatest businesses and, and business opportunities in the world, and it's a, a real tribute to our region and to you uh, that we continue to keep uh, this area of Washington economically strong and economically v vibrant. It's a, it's a great story. Uh, and it seems appropriate topic for me since uh, I'm ultimately responsible, I guess, for keeping the lights on on the other side of the lake. I take no responsibility for the Seattle lights. But we do strongly encourage you to make sure you heat your homes with gas on this si <laughs> side of the, of the lake. Uh, the furnaces, the hot water, uh, all of which are important priorities to what I would argue is uh, an economically healthy and strong, diversified business economy. Um, it's a two-way street, I guess I have to acknowledge, uh, that um, if this region is economically healthy, and I believe it is, I believe it's an amazing what has happened in the last four to five years, and I think where we may be going over the next five to ten, ten years looking at all the basic business, business indicators. Obviously, if we can keep our cost of energy down, gas and electric, it ultimately helps drive and continues the thrust and strength of the uh, economic rebound, which is a, a lot of what we're seeing around us today. I do have one caveat with regard to that, and that is the one issue that I'm sure a number of you might want to have some chats with me about afterwards, which, which are what, what I tend to call Mother Nature. And uh, on occasion, Mother Nature does not necessarily cooperate, uh, and I think that was clearly underscored by the huge storm in December. In my experience, unprecedented, over a million customers without electricity, some for as much as a week. Uh, that is not necessarily productive for a healthy economy. And I can assure you that we, are, we don't necessarily get any revenues when we don't have our either electric service uh, operating or if Seattle City Light's electric service 
isn't driving the fans for our gas heaters in Seattle. We aren't getting gas revenues either. So it, it's a cold and ugly day. So it really speaks to some of the things that this, this region really has to continue to do with regard to what I would call infrastructure. And infrastructure is a topic that you've all heard a lot about. Uh, and it's not just energy, but energy is a fundamental part of the infrastructure, infrastructure issues in this region. You can't spend time in this region without confronting infrastructure issues, whether it's the viaduct, whether it's 520, 405 and freeways, whether it's our sewer systems, um, whether it's um, our connectivity to the world through uh, high-speed internet or whatever, these infrastructure uh, items are vital to our economic health and our growth. And a quick observation from me is for us to continue to deal with the issue of infrastructure, you have to act today so that the future that we want for tomorrow happens somewhere near our own lifetime. And that's abundantly clear, I think, and more so um, after the storms of the last month with regard to the utility service systems. Uh, for us to continue to thrive, we need to have a strong and healthy and robust utility infrastructure. It cannot be disrupted by storms. It cannot be disrupted by earthquakes, by volcanic eruptions or tsunamis. By and large, I would just offer the observation that I think the region performed well. Others will disagree with me. I've heard a number of stories from a, probably a number of you here with regard to their version and views of it. But I think there are lessons to be learned and infrastructure is an important piece of it. Keep in mind, to continue to drive the economic engine of this region, we will need both infrastructure and associated resources. I will laughingly tell you that we, if you look at two icons, energy icons of this region, some of you may understand them, some of you may not, but if you go to Snoqualmie Falls, uh, one of the great tourist attractions of our region, and you look down into the cavity under the rock, there's this amazing electric power plant that was put in service in 1898. And when it was put in service in 1898, it was going to provide all the electric service for Everett, Seattle, and Tacoma. It was out of date in two years. I would say the same thing with regard to the other icon, which is uh, there's this modest little park at the end of Lake Union called Gas Works Park. And some of you may remember when the gas, uh, both for the streetlights in downtown Seattle and then subsequently for some of the heating, was coming from what is now a, 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 a controversial location for rock concerts. Uh, <laughs> but that particular facility, the gas load in western Washington today is over 600 million cubic feet of gas a day. The Gas Works Park at its peak could, could, could contribute 10. So stop and think about what has happened with regard to, to, to the growth of this region and the energy implications of that over the course of the last 100 years, 50 years, and 60 years, and then think ahead about the issues that confront us in the future. If I looked at Snoqualmie Falls, Snoqualmie Falls generation today, uh, we can get 30 megawatts out of that. We just finished our wild horse wind farm, the top of, Ellensburg, uh, of the, of the I-90 off in Ellensburg, which will produce on an average wind day over 300 megawatts, 10, 10 times as much clean energy as what we got clean energy out of Snoqualmie Falls. That's the scale leap. Um, Likewise, we are able to do today through the efforts of our customers and you and everyone here, through wise and efficient use of energy, we can get 30 megawatts on average almost per year by having you use your energy a lot more intelligently and use some compact fluorescent light bulbs and other, other methods which will reduce energy consumption almost to the extent of the volume of output today currently from Snoqualmie Falls. Important infrastructure challenges. We've added 160,000 160, new electric customers in the last five years. 
by the year 2015, we expect in this region that we will need 1,500 megawatts. Just to put into perspective, 1,500 megawatts is the, about the current average demand for the city of Seattle. So between now and 2015, simply to meet the energy requirements today, even with a robust, incredible energy efficiency ethic in this region, there's a lot that needs to be done. And that's all infrastructure. And that's just the business infrastructure. That's the hard, what we call pipes and wires in my business. Let me talk a little bit about the other part of the infrastructure, and that's what I would call the workforce infrastructure. Uh, at our company, we're confronting this problem of employees to, to understand and rebuild or repair or even grow the utility system, you need a, an expertise that is not necessarily popular today. Um, we have an aging workforce. We have a difficult time. We have an aging workforce. Sorry, Ralph. Signal, signal me if I. We have an aging workforce. Um, 75% of our employees are 40 years old or greater. 60% uh, of, of our employees will be eligible for retirement within 10 years. We're not alone. In the utility industry, for half of utility industry's workers will el be eligible for retirement in five years. And these are the same people that rushed and worked very diligently to repair and put back into service the utility systems after the storms. This is a technical problem, technology problem. It's an interest problem. Uh, the utility business and the utility sector is not necessarily perceived as glamorous today. We aren't high tech. Uh, we're not uh, a fun, perceived to be a fun place to work. This is hard work, work that needs to be done. There's some incredible efforts through the unions, through schools and others to develop training programs, partnerships, uh, community colleges, an example is the Center of Excellence at Centralia Community, Community College where we're training people to be operators in our power plants. They have to go through an apprentice program, but it's a very important program. Um, we have to do something to deal with this issue of people. Let me also speak about the other passion that I have and the number of us have in this business community, and it's not just people per se, but what I'd characterize as workforce diversity, and sp specifically getting our workforce to look like the population we're a part of as our population exists today and as it will continue to change over the next generation. Uh, there are many local companies that are committed to increasing diversity within their own ranks and within their own supplier base. Uh, and I would just offer that there are a number of us who are concerned that we are not doing enough and that there is a lot more that can be done. Workplace diversity is an obvious priority of the Seattle Rotary, uh, witnessed by the Minority Business Mentors Program. And it's clearly a priority for this region too, but we need to continue to see what we can do about it. One of the things that uh, a number of business leaders have been involved with for several years is what we call the BOLD initiative. The BOLD initiative is a, a, an activity that grew together through several different businesses in this region, primarily the CEOs, the strong leadership, who started to talk and compare ideas about how diversity could be dealt with within their own respected, respective businesses. And that dialogue has taken place, as I call it, in a somewhat stealth fashion for four to five years. And recently that group, uh, which I chair, uh, which by, uh, by uh, the executive committee includes Steve Rogel of Weyerhaeuser, includes Jim Senegal from Costco, includes Phyllis Campbell from the Seattle Foundation. And I would say a broad-based broad uh, set of over 17 very significant business leaders from very successful businesses in this community who are basically saying it's time to have Bold come out of the closet and come talk more in the, about the community and compare notes with the community about what our needs are 
within businesses and what is of already available and see if we can't in effect create some channels to accomplish something and we've done that we've started that process and I'm thrilled uh, to to let you know that uh, Mac Hogan's and Mac I know you're there uh, has agreed and is now serving as our executive director of the Bold Initiative on a full-time capacity on our behalf. Mac, why don't you stand up and let people recognize you. <laughs> and he's got his own, his own set of advisors uh, cross-sectionally from, from, the, from in the area, some of whom are here. Craig Dawson from Retail Lockbox. Craig, I, I know you're here. Um, Fred, Fred Kiga from Russell Investments in Tacoma, and uh, Susana Gonzalez Murillo from U.S. Bank are three parts of Mac's kitchen cabinet, which within the Bold Initiative, using the leverage that this CEO group has, Mac is looking at and considering different ways they can connect with different business partners, different business groups, in a way that would help create, and I think the, f the first priorities uh, really are what we call the pipeline of talented, diverse people to grow it within our business community. We're looking for the opportunity at the entry level, at the at senior management level, at the officer and executive level, and at the board of director level in some of our public companies to, to bring in talented people, have them feel comfortable in this community, have them be a part of this community, have them flourish, and not have them leave. Uh, a number of frustrations from some of the company leaders are that, um, as, is that this may, may not be as welcoming a community for a diverse workplace as we want to make it. So these are some of the challenges we're working with, and where we're trying to ne ne work with uh, parties who would be partners with regard to higher educational opportunities, with regard to uh, building ties with local operations and organizations and tapping into community ambassadors that would work recognizing the divergent and different business plans that all these different businesses have and the business leaders have and different needs. Nordstrom's has different business plans than REI, than does Weyerhaeuser, than does Puget Sound Energy. But if we all as leaders can work together and make, take advantage of the resources that these companies can have and can do both locally and with those companies that have broader footprints, we think it will do well for the respective companies as well as for the community at large. We've got a lot of ground to cover. We haven't made great strides. We are coming out. Um, I'm pleased, I'm proud of what, uh, what Mac is starting up out, and I think we can make some further progress both within our respective companies and within the region at large. Um, like diversity in nature, diversity in the workforce makes us all stronger, healthier, smarter, more nimble and responsive, and it's basically good business. And it's an in inherent part of the infrastructure, just like I characterize our pipes and wires and transportation, so are our people, and so is a diversified workforce. So with that, I'd be glad to take any questions before Todd throws me off up here. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Uh, Danner and Faith have the microphones, and we have time for uh, about eight or so minutes of questions. I'd just like to say that uh, as a person who spent 30 years training a very diverse workforce of uh, qualified power plant operators, uh, I think you should hang your shingle outside uh, the Navy base at Bremerton and the sub base uh, at Bangor and the shipyard at, at Everett, and you'll find an awful lot of highly diverse and talented uh, people ready to go to work for you right there. Staying with the idea of infrastructure, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the need for regional power grids. And the hurdle seems to be getting private and public power to work together and decide who's going to spend the money and will they get a return. Can you speak to that problem? Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, there's, there's been a, a source of frustration with regard to how to build what I call the big 
three ways for, for power. We are a net importer of power in this region. Um, yet the population's all on the west side. The power comes from other areas, so the pathway needs to be done. And how to build it, who will finance it, what the mechanisms are to recover the cost of that investment are complex and controversial. And I think that's probably, it's like building anything else in this region. It's complex and it's controversial and it takes a long time. I have said numerous times, I find both windmills and electric transmission very aesthetically pleasing, but ironically others don't. Uh, yes, we have a question here. Steve, I'm very impressed with your work in wind energy. Are, are you looking at solar energy or distributed um, generation as a way to meet needs in the future? Two quick answers. Um, simply, the answer is yes. Uh, right now at our wild horse facility out of, out of Ellensburg, we just hosted on virtually the coldest day of the year uh, uh, on this beautiful 10,000 acre site where the windmills are, a, uh, a, a meeting for bidders for what we will we hope will be the single largest one, uh, one location solar facility in, in the Northwest. Uh, we, we're, we're out to bid on that. Frankly, that's a site that we think has better sun. It's a little tough to do that over on this side. A better uh, orientations, and believe me, if somebody can develop a, develop a solar facility that can handle that site where the wind was blowing 100 miles an hour when those contractors were there when it was, it was almost one degree Fahrenheit, uh, it will be a great uh, adjunct. Um, in addition to solar, we're continuing to look at other kinds of, of, of non-traditional alternatives. Um, it, it's it's going to take time. The economics are still questionable, but somebody's got to push them forward. What are you doing to harden our uh, grid against terrorist attack? You know, the irony here is that I think that um, I'm less, you know, I probably shouldn't say this, I'm less concerned about terrorists than I, I'm the, 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 the terrorist of, of Mother Nature, um, who has the incredible capability of, of creating a storm that will come in from north of Vancouver to south of Portland and, and knock out the entire area. Uh, beyond that, there's an incredible set of coordination between city, state, federal, uh, and county entities with regard to how to protect and deal with isolated, what I call, point types of uh, terrorist threats. Since I had a <coughs> teenager... <coughs> Wants to go to work for a utility? No. <laughs> there's still time. My wife and I come... My wife and I'd come home at night, and every every light in the house would be burning. Every radio and TV and everything would be on. And I want I want you to put the meter in the kitchen, and uh, <laughs> and put a siren on it or something. That, uh, but I'm really kind of serious about this. I think there should be some device that, in today's world, we ought to be able to develop some device that could go in the kitchen to show us what our power, what we're using, because. We're sitting here talking about conservation at this table, and, and people don't know any idea what they're using or how they're doing. It's measured in dollars. <laughs> yeah, you know, Ralph, uh, those are good suggestions, and it's exactly the way the, where things are headed. Technology is being implemented in, in, the, in that, those areas in ways that we never thought of before. Every P Puget Sound Energy meter today is read remotely. From that, we gain information. For those of you who want to, can and who, who are interested can get on the internet and they can monitor their energy usage based on the technology we have with regard to energy use. Now, is that an in-your-face signal? No, it's not the same one that the teenager may, may respond to. There's not a, an alarm or a bell or whistle, but I think over the next several years, that's the direction we will be going. We have proposed some experimental programs, uh, had them authorized, and we will be headed in that direction in the next year or two. If you find an alarm or a bell or a whistle that a teenager will be will respond to, you'll have a whole business on your own right there. I, I think the mayor of Mercer Island is another one to ask a question. Uh, mine is an old-fashioned question, I guess. When do you think we might see a resurgence of the nuclear industry, which would provide power 
24 hours a day, 365 days a year, whether the wind blows or the sun shines? You know, that question gets asked of me all the time. I do think that there will be a modest resurgence of the nuclear industry uh, in this country sometime in the next 10 to 15 years. I think the whole debate that you're confronting in Congress w uh, today with regard to greenhouse gases and carbon emissions will lead to to, to people looking again at nuclear because there is no carbon associated with, with nuclear ener energy. However, I don't, don't know many people who are jumping for joy over the notion of fin financing or dealing with the issues associated with building and uh, the long lead times associated with, with permitting and the, the unending issue of what you do with the with the waste from nuclear plants. Hence, I don't think that there's going to be a lot happening in Washington on that area very, very soon. The uh, usage or demand of natural gas seems to have skyrocketed the last three years. And many people forecast that usage will stay at that high level. Uh, the liquid natural gas terminals don't seem to be coming online fast enough to make a meaningful difference. Do you, in your forecast, do you see natural gas at a permanently high level, $7 and above for the foreseeable future? I certainly hope not. We all hope that the price of natural gas will continue to drop, but it's the classic example of supply demand. Uh, we've seen it in the last two weeks. There had been no winter in the east until two weeks ago. Gas prices actually dropped during de December and early January. And then in the last two weeks, when it finally got cold in the East Coast, you find, you know, the people who were jogging in 70-degree in weather in Central Park finally dropped. Prices went up above $7 again. We do need to get, and I will, I will be strong, with regard to this issue of infrastructure, we need to get liquefied natural gas facilities in this country. We need to augment our supply. We are, we have got to, to add supply so that the prices will stabilize. It's frankly one of the best uh, and, and cleanest energy sources we have. Thanks, Steve. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank yeah. you for everything. Uh, the Q&A is always the best part. Thanks. I, I hope you all enjoyed this meeting as much as I did. I enjoy being in a room full of bright-eyed people, and I particularly enjoyed all the bright-eyed undergraduate business students we had here today. Thanks for your leadership, Steve, not only at uh, PSE but in the community and for your work on this issue. It's tremendously important, both the uh, hard wires and pipes and the people. Uh, people are what make the difference. Griff, we are honored, sir, to have you as a member of this great club. Thanks for your vision and leadership. You're an inspiration to us all. You know, business is booming, and if you don't believe it, Go out and try to book a venue for Wednesday at noon. Uh, next week, we will be at Pier 66, the Bell Harbor International Conference Center. And uh, I don't say that to disparage it. It's just that it's not the most convenient venue for many of you. It is a program that I don't think you'll want to miss. Some of you have read about this and heard about it. Michael Regan, a local artist, paints custom portraits of fallen soldiers, and he is committed to paint a personal portrait of every soldier losing his life in the war against terror. He will be our speaker next week, and it's a program I know that you won't want to miss. Don't forget, you students, to ask for those ballet tickets. You won't regret it. That brings us to this week's pretty good rule. If I had been, this is one of my absolute favorite rules. If I'd been paying attention, I would have had it right up front early in the year, and that is, it is rare for someone to remark, gosh, that speech was too short. <laughs> See you next week. We are adjourned. Seattle Rotary Online is made possible in part by a grant from Enterprise Seattle. For over 35 years, Enterprise Seattle has provided client-based economic development services to businesses throughout King County and its 39 cities. More information on Enterprise Seattle and how they help businesses grow and prosper can be found at www.enterpriseseattle.org. And by First Choice Health, working with the Washington Health Information Collaborative to use technology to bring better health care to patients throughout the Pacific Northwest. First Choice Health.